practices. Viewer discretion is advised. Very good morning to everybody. Thanks for joining us on our Sunrise Safari on a very cool breezy morning here at uh, Juma Private Game Reserve. Of course in the world renowned Wasabi Sands, South Africa. Good morning everybody. My name is Cedric and behind the camera with me here on Rusty we've got Odie. Thanks for joining us. And yes I am sitting at Gauri Dam at the moment and uh, apparently there was uh, Molawati was around here and he was having a confrontation with uh, another leopard this side early hours this morning so we are just trying to see if we can listen out and follow up on uh, uh, those uh, leopards around uh, Gauri uh, Dam I'm hoping that we are going to be successful with them but yes, as you can see, it's a li uh, live and interactive show. So if you've got any questions and comments, uh, please send them through. So if you are watching on our Wild Earth website, make sure that you do register so you can send those comments and questions through. Or if you are watching on the YouTube channel, make sure that you do click on the subscribe button so you can get all our latest Wild Earth uh, content. As well, joining us on uh, Drive this morning on Wendy, we've got uh, James and Ghat. Up there in Pridelands, we've got Andrew and Panda. All the way in the north or west in Madikwe, we've got Lauren and Davi. And then down in the eastern Cape at Amakala, Tess and Igor. So yes, I'm sure we are going to have a fantastic drive this morning. Um, as I said, I am here at the Gauri Dam. I'm just trying to listen out. I've got some birds a little bit crazy on the one side towards Caligo Pan. I know that James is going to head around into that direction. So what I'm going to do, I think I'm going to head over the dam wall to the northern side of this dam and to see if that male leopard, because apparently his last uh, movements uh, this morning, not too long ago, I think it was about an hour and a half ago, was going into the northern side and heading into this drainage line. Uh, but you know it is Molawati. He is uh, of course the dominant male of this area and we usually call him the ghost of Juma because he is like a ghost so it is quite tough to try and locate on. But yeah, while we do that, uh, let's take a look at the weather all over today. everyone we are looking at the fantastic skies of Medikwe and believe it or not that thicker part of the horizon there is actually a giraffe we've been having the most incredible there we go the most incredible morning sighting with these giraffes we actually can't go anywhere because one is in fact blocking the road however good morning my name is Lauren I do have Davi on camera and if you just look here you will see our lounging giraffe who looks very relaxed you're not at the beach darling you're actually on the road hmm yeah and that means that we can get past but you look very comfortable however I don't know what our plans are for this morning I think we're just gonna bumble Yesterday we planned to find Mama Chira and Cubs and we got two lionesses hunting and killing a warthog and having a huge fight for over an hour and 15 minutes. So to be honest, when you make plans in Medikwe, they don't always go to plan. And with this roadblock, I don't know when we're going to be able to move. I don't want to move you. <laughs> Just lounging. Oliver, I agree. It's always a little bit comical when you see these giraffes because 
they just look a little bit awkward, but I must say this one looks very comfortable. Look at it, just chilling. But seeing them get up is often what makes me feel a little bit sad. They really don't get up easy, especially if they've been sitting for a long time and it's cold. So I don't really want to start all this one because it will take it a while to, for it to stand up. <laughs> but Oliver, I agree, it's rather comical. Especially when you see the young calves and you just see their little heads popping up over the grass. You think, what is that? And then you realize it's a sitting down young giraffe. <laughs> it's always great to have a giraffe sighting first thing in the morning, especially we're going to have a sunrise today. We did not have one yesterday and that was very sad, but we're going to have one today. Give it another 20 minutes. Einstein! My goodness, you fancy some lions or hyenas. Well, I fancy that too, Einstein. I don't really know what we can do in terms of the hyena front, apart from just cross our fingers. But in terms of the lion front, Medique can definitely deliver that. It's funny, in South Africa they say holding thumbs. And it's so bizarre, I have never heard that before. And I really... There we go. There we go. That's better. Oh, a big stretch. I've never heard holding things, thumbs before. I don't really know what it means, but all our directors will say it to us. But it's odd to me, I will always say crossing fingers. It's funny, different expressions in different parts of the world. But hyenas, definitely at the top of my list. Brown or spotted, I have the option here. Ah, this has been such a wonderful sighting and at least our roadblock has now gotten up. So while we bumble on, we're going to send you guys over to James to say good morning. I must say I absolutely agree with Lauren that when you watch a, a giraffe get up, it is a sad event almost because it looks like it's such a massive effort. It's a little bit like watching my wife get up in the morning. I find that quite sad as well because it takes such an enormous amount of effort. I'm pretty sure she's not watching so we should be okay. Hello everybody, my name is James Hendry. We've got, oh, uh, not, <laughs> we've got Big Gerrit on camera today. Oof, I nearly got a flat hand there. And um, uh, we are also, as always, on the quest for a leopard. There are some female leopard tracks coming into the reserve from the east. We'll head that way and see if we can't give, those, give whoever's following those ones a hand and maybe we'll be lucky today. Remember, you are the most important part of the safari. We want to hear from you. Questions, comments, insults and jokes, all will be welcome. Not so many insults, unless they're really clever, in which case we'll take them. We'll take clever insults any day, not just abusive ones. It was a very quiet night, but maybe because I was asleep. There were some lions calling far to the north. But other than that, oh, we didn't hear anything. A bit of action on the damn cam, as no doubt me mate Sedders has explained to you. But otherwise, Everything is quiet here. Two herds of buffalo yesterday knocking about the reserve and I was rather hoping that those would attract the lions. Charlie, you say you're hoping to see some big buffs this AM. You, you know, you're the second person who surprised me. One of, somebody last night said they'd rather see buffalo than leopard. Uh, and I thought that was quite shocking. Um, 
and now you say you want to see some big buffs this morning. Well, I think we've probably got a relatively good chance of seeing some big buffs this morning. I mean, I like the odd big buff sighting, but I must confess that it doesn't fill me with a great sense of wonder. But maybe that's just because I've seen too many big buffs. I'm just going to hail Cedric on the radio. There he is, I can see him. But the channel is busy. He's going up towards the clearings outside our camp. So I think he'll probably head down towards the central parts of the reserve, following up on these kitties that were having a little contretemps next to the next to the dam. I was just saying to Kharit as we drove out of camp. And I, I mean, some of you are going to disagree with me, there's no question, but I really wouldn't be too sad if Molwati was chased from this area by a leopard that was slightly more confiding and prepared to be looked at. So, uh, if Molwati the male leopard was chased off by, imagine, Mzemba, Hosanna's son. Uh, Hosanna, very famous leopard here, and Mzemba, I'm sure, would like to make very famous. Imagine that happened. I don't think there'd be too many uh, dry eyes. Such joy would we feel. I don't think there'd be too many tears shed for the departure of Mulwati to somewhere where there are left fewer people who want to look at leopards. He should go and live just in the Western Kruger there. Perfect place for him. Anyway, that's how it is. We're going to head off towards the east and see if we can pick up these female tracks. Are you ready for our next donation goal? For our generous donors who contribute 100 US dollars or more, we're offering a once in a lifetime private safari experience. You will be able to choose Lauren, Steve or Cedric as your personal guide and enjoy an authentic private wild earth safari. Let's hit that donation goal and embark on an unforgettable journey through the wilderness together. Good morning, good morning everybody. It's a giraffes kind of day it seems. Lots of giraffes all over the place. We're at Amakala Game Reserve down in the Eastern Cape. It's a pleasure having you on safari this morning and welcome to the Amakala journey. <laughs> Quite literally. 
<laughs> now we've got quite a few giraffes that have just started waking up and it seems like the first order of the day is feeding. This big bull that's now feeding was actually lying down and now he's having some breakfast now that he's had a stretch. I'm not going to show you my face because it is quite dark but my name is Tess and behind the camera is Igor. It is really nice having you with us. Now it's always a good day when you get to start your safari with giraffes so the fact that you've already had two sets this morning is amazing. I'm hoping that these ones decide to stick around and potentially even come a little bit closer, never mind. <laughs> disappearing behind the bushes to have some breakfast <laughs> but we do have quite an intense plan for the morning we plan on sitting with some giraffes <laughs> no, I'm joking so we are actually going to go and have a look if we can find the three cheetahs because yesterday we had one of the cheetah brothers on an ostrich kill but the other two were nowhere to be seen <clears throat> and that male that was on the kill was calling and calling and searching and there was we thought a response we thought we could hear cheetahs but maybe we weren't hearing them I don't know and so our plan for the morning is to continue towards that area of the ostrich kill and see if there's been any change on the cheetah boys <laughs> Darren good morning Yes, I agree. I love it too. A Makala starts with a journey of giraffes. It's just too good. It is actually one of the best things to me about a Makala is not the fact that we can see lions and elephants. It's yes, the cheetahs because they are unusual. It is nice to be able to spend time with them. <laughs> look at that one coming out on the right. <laughs> it gave us such a sneaky look. <laughs> no, it's literally right like to the right of that one you were yeah, there. It gave us such a sneaky look as it snuck up behind that bush. <laughs> uh, but yes, the, the cheetahs are very special, but the plains game in Amakala is unlike anywhere else to me. There's just so much happening all the time. And I've said it multiple times, but I'll say it again, Darren, if we sit with these giraffes, we will find 50 other things if we sit. And we just let it play out in front of us which is really cool. <laughs> Where are you going? There's just something very peaceful about a giraffe start to the day though. Uh, coming out towards the right there. Having a feed. It's very important to get your greens in, you know? I'm not much of a greens person, I must tell you. I love salads, I'm not much of a veggie person. Maybe I could pretend, if I was a giraffe, I would probably pretend that the sweet thorns were part of my salad. Oh, don't leave. <laughs> so it seems like all of a sudden everybody is getting super active and spreading out to go and get their nutritious greens in. So I think we are going to carry on and see if we can find you the cheetah boys and send you over to Andrew who has got some sunshine. <laughs> Good to know Tess, you must eat your vegetables, very important. Good morning everybody, welcome to Pridelands on a wonderful morning. The sun is shining, it's a little bit cool this morning but it's going to be about a 31 degree celsius day so pun and i we are preparing for that good morning good morning my name's andrew and behind the camera is still mr panda morris he's not with us this morning but that's all right we're gonna you know bumble on the roads and we're gonna hopefully find some tracks this morning of hopefully leopard we are hoping to find you some leopard this morning yeah let's see how that goes but let's watch the sun rising before it disappears totally well not disappear but sort of just miss the best part of it Beautiful, isn't it? Now the sunrises out here are, are quite spectacular, I must say, uh, because you know the the bush is quite flat here, so it is very pretty to watch the sunrise and sunset for that matter. Now this morning we got reports that there's some monkeys alarm calling in the northern part of Pridelands, close to an area called HQ, 
and uh, so we're going to go and follow up there. It could be one of two things that we reckon, because uh, the lion tracks and we left the lion sort of in a block waiting for them to come out yesterday afternoon, which they didn't while we were on the safari. Um, they could have easily have gone north, which wasn't far from where they were. So it could be lions. The next thing it could be is also leopard, because Morris said he had leopard tracks and they were going north, not far from here towards that area. So it could be one of the two. We're really hoping it's going to be leopard this morning. I have seen a leopard out here before um, with Chris on my very second day that I was here. Um, and we never managed to show you uh, that leopard because of signal related problems. Good morning, George. Yo, the most reliable alarm call for me. Monkeys and baboons are very good. And then also kudu and bushbuck along those lines as well. If you ever you know, going on a safari and you hear this, wow, wow, ah, you must investigate that. That's going to be more than likely a kudu that's barking, and kudu don't bark for no reason. Usually it means lion or leopard in the area. Could also, you know, signify, you know, spotted a hyena walking around, but definitely something around. So we follow up. But one of the birds that has got very unreliable alarm calls, and that's the, the guinea fowl. Sometimes, you know, they, they panic. For all sorts of things, even small raptors and things like that, like like goshawks. Out here, it's not going to be the pale chanting goshawk like at, at um, Amakala. Out here, it's the dark chanting goshawk, but they do specialize in hunting guinea fowl, so they could be alarm calling for that. Franklins are very good, or spur fowls. They're very good with their alarm calls. Listening to a long bull crombeck at the moment. It's a bit far off, and a crested barbet. And I can hear a red-billed hornbill as well. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yes, Scarlet, morning it is. It's very, very peachy sunrise this morning. We're enjoying it very much. So myself and Panda, we get up way before that sun rises. So when we're up and about getting our little cooler box ready because we have some coffee on board with us, making sure that the vehicles, uh, you know, all the fluids and vitals have been checked. We're doing that in complete darkness. Um, so headlamps and torches are all required. But then as soon as we set off from drive and uh, Jared says, OK, guys, we are going mobile. Enjoy your drive. Then uh, the sun has already r risen. So, yeah. Just a lovely morning. Oh, exciting. Alarm call so early in the morning. Good luck, Andrew. I hope you find something spectacular. We found some more giraffes on this side, so that's feeling pretty good. And we've got some light for a change. And some paintbrushes, yes. Some very explosive little fluffy paintbrushes. Hello, cuties. These are the same three that we were looking at, their fluffy ossicones yesterday three tiny tots that seem to be spending all their time together so this is going to be a very interesting trio <laughs> well i'm so happy there's actually some light now it's getting later and later every morning as we go in towards the middle of winter it feels like we're already past the middle of winter and yet it's just starting in reality but I suppose it's going to be a cold one. <laughs> oh, hello little one. You are so cute. Now these are the three umbilical brothers. All of them still have drying out umbilical cords hanging from their bellies, which is a testament to their age. Yeah, the giraffe coalition instead of the cheetah coalition. <laughs> Wow, they are so cute, those three. I do find it interesting that all three are so young and yet there's one that's really tiny, one that's really big, and one somewhere in the middle. It's quite fascinating. <laughs> Hi, gorgeous ones.
I'm so impressed by how adventurous they've become since we first met these three. They were sticking to mum, particularly this little one that's now staring at us in front. It was sticking to mum's legs, not willing to leave her side. And within three weeks, we've got a whole lot of exploring and personality and all sorts of good things, gaining in confidence. Yeah. And we'll just pop up onto the cut line and have a look at your list of them. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Cool. Good luck. See you later. Sorry about that, everybody. I was just having a small conversation with another guide who's driving around looking for interesting things. He did see some elephants and uh, some bee farlows up here on the eastern boundary. So we'll go and have a look on the eastern boundary. We did have tracks, always tracks, of a big male leopard coming in an easterly direction. I am 99% sure that those were the tracks for Morwati the male leopard, he who does not want to be seen. And so we did not make a massive effort to find out where they went. Pop up here onto the eastern boundary and hopefully be faced with a number of buffalo bulls. Which, of course, will make at least one of you very happy. Hello, Matt. Very variable. We don't, you know, you can't really put a time on it. Uh, well, you could probably say on average that a male leopard will hold a territory for maybe three years on average. Some will be longer, some will be shorter. And just because a leopard loses a territory doesn't mean he won't take another one. Classic example, one of the very famous leopards from this area, Tingana, he lost uh, a territory off to the west of where we are now, currently occupied by the tortoise pan male and he lost that territory to a, a big male leopard called the Anderson male and he just shifted across to here and took a territory from a much older male called Mvula and so and you know he was kind of he was still relatively in his prime I think he was eight when he took over the territory here maybe nine no he was eight so it you know because they chased out it doesn't mean that that will be it forever, A, and B, it's also important to remember that it depends on the amount of pressure. So the only reason Tingana came across here was because he felt pressure from there and because there was a kind of opportunity here. But if that hadn't been the case, if there'd been no pressure, then he'd probably just have stayed. Okay, let's go and check in with Lauren. I'm going to see if I can find these beefalos up here. Our sun is rising. Look at that. Sitting here under a shepherd's tree, which is very iconic of Medikwe, listening to the not so beautiful calls of the lilac breasted roller that has perched itself right next to our sunrise. This is the most Medikwe scene I could possibly ever think of. Now we just need to hear a lion's roar, the soundtrack to our sunrise.
Jerry. This is what you're talking about. Beautiful scene. We wanted to make it as medique as possible, and I think we've managed. Listen to that roller. Mama Kim, you are saying amazing artistry. Artistry, Davi. Took us a while to get this one, but we position in the best way. Isn't it beautiful? Davi likes to be very artistic with the sunrises. I'm so glad we got to share that with all of you. We're going to go and look for some lions now. And you guys are going to go back over to Tess. <laughs> Sounds like it's going to be an adventure. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> On this side, we are still admiring the three little troublemakers of the journey. And we've just witnessed something very interesting. So one of the tiny little ones, it's yeah, that one coming in from the right now. That little one was trying to suckle from its mom and she started allowing it. And then one of the slightly bigger calves, it's actually going to come in from the right as, as well came and tried to suckle at the same time from that little one's mom which I have never seen a different calf try and suckle from a giraffe mom before the mom actually got really irritated but she let it happen for a few seconds and then she got super irritated and kicked them off and carried on so now the three of them are sulking together about the fact that none of them got enough milk but I have never known giraffes to allo suckle. <laughs> run, little one, run. <laughs> so much energy this morning. But it was fascinating to watch how it was the two that are now on the right, that very tiny one and then the larger of the three. The opposite ends of the baby spectrum were trying to suckle from the same mum. And it's definitely the smallest one's mum because it went straight up to that one, started rubbing its face all over her, immediately started suckling. She was happy. And then the big one came in and spoiled all the fun. How odd. Oh, what have you two heard? You're frozen like statues. Janice, I wouldn't say that it's odd to have so many babies all at once. Um, it actually looks like there's a few more that are maybe a, a month or two older as well. So in total, there's about five or six smallish ones in this family, but three that are really small. Um, and it's really not that unusual because the females might be coming into estrus at around the same time. And that's really helpful for the giraffes. Any herbivore will try and have the strategy of flooding the system with so many babies at the same time that more of them are likely to survive because the predators won't have just one to target. They'll have multiple. We're having a little, oh no, I thought it was a grooming session. Never mind. This one's just standing around looking like a, it's a bit confused while the other one is feeding. But yes, it's quite normal for even zebras, impalas, hartebeests, 
black wildebeest to have calves at the same time. Anna Marie, that's exactly what it is. It's a little giraffe calf nursery. So for the first kind of week or two, they take their time really just getting to know their environment, but sticking to mom as much as possible and literally finding their legs because their legs are so long, it's quite difficult to maintain your balance when you're a baby giraffe. Um, but uh, once they've kind of gotten used to that, they all start forming together in their little nursery club. And then they start adventuring. They move around together, they play, they chase each other, they run. They really just start testing their own boundaries to see what they are and aren't capable of. And I can tell you now there's very little that they aren't capable of. They just don't know it. So they try and test everything. But it's so cute seeing such tiny little giraffes. Perfect miniatures. All adventuring together. But they really have changed so much in the last three weeks. They've grown up so much already. David Wild thing, giraffes have two teats, what are called induinal teats, so they're between the butt legs. They're actually very tough to see. It's not like an udder. They are tiny, tiny, tiny looking from the outside, so it can be really tough to even spot them. Very, very tough to spot them. They'll be just between the back legs and you can honestly hardly see them, unless the mom pulls a very interesting pose with her leg out backwards and she gives us a stretch. Hello, little one. <laughs> the Fluffy Cones Club. Look at those little fluffy ossicones on the top of its head. That is so sweet. Leopard lover, do you know what? I completely agree with you. We could get some pretty decent hairstyling ideas from these little ones. I think they are absolutely fabulous with their hairstyles like that. To me, there is honestly just something about a baby giraffe. I don't know why it gets me so much, but it does. I think they are brilliant. And they're always so cute, you know? They're always just happy to be around and be the cutest thing and, and be playful and happy. This little one's getting left behind. It is one of the slightly older calves, so I suppose that makes sense. It's less inclined to just run around like mad and try and figure out what's happening because it already knows a decent amount. <laughs> Probably more important to get some breakfast in when you're a few months old get ready for the day and then you can play a little later. Lawrence, it is very possible that all of the little ones have the same father and I, in fact I think it's that big one on the right. He is the biggest giraffe of all of them here. He's about to disappear behind the thickets but he is so much taller than the females and seems to be the only very big male around so I would guess that he is in fact the father. And I'm actually just thinking now, I'm sorry, they have four teats, not two. <laughs> we just can't see the other two because they're so hidden behind the first two. They look like little, they look like little imperfections on the skin. They're so small. <laughs> so I shall correct myself there. They definitely have four, not two. We only see two, if you look really hard. <laughs> This is so sweet seeing the whole family kind of come together and I find it quite fascinating. If you can spend a lot of time with a particular journey of giraffes, you actually start seeing individual personalities. You start seeing a bit of the dynamics as well, how they move around each other, how they treat each other. The basic respect that they have for each other. It really is quite beautiful. They're definitely on a mission now. It's, it's breakfast time. They're starting to spread out. They're starting to disappear into the thickets. Once they want to move, they will move and they can move pretty far with legs that long.
thanks to our wonderful Wild Earth Explorers, Wild Earth Kids is back. Your monthly subscriptions have allowed us to relaunch Wild Earth Schools on a weekly basis, every Wednesday for the first hour of the Sunset Safari. You guys bring a smile to my face every single day. Sign your class up for a special virtual field trip to Africa, because touching the lives of the future protectors of our Earth truly matters. One thing I have not seen from this journey, with the now hidden journey pretty much, <laughs> is this big male. I haven't seen him interact much with the calves. Uh, male giraffes don't really have much of a role in parental care, ever. But I suppose they do have a role in protecting the family. It's mostly mom who does all of the affection side and the keeping the little one incredibly safe underneath her legs. But I would find it interesting to see if this big male, if he would play with the youngsters, if he would groom them. So I don't think I've ever really seen him even pay attention to them. He kind of just walks past and starts sniffing at the females again. One thing on his mind, making more. Hey, big boy. You can see he's a fairly old bull because if you have a look at that silhouette of his head, his horns are really big and thick. So those ossicones. And as he turns to the side, have a look at that lumpy section. Ah, oh, never mind, gone. Lumpy section between his eyes, so he's definitely an older boy. All right, I think we're going to head on and see if we can find the cheetahs. Thank you, giraffes. And we'll send you over to James, who's at the waterhole. Well, I hope you find your cheetahs too, Tessa. Um, I must confess that here at Juma, there is not a lot going on. We've got some water here at the dam, that is Biffle's Hook. I will tell you, for those of that you are, for those of you that are regular viewers, the Unkohuma Pride times 12, sitting on another reserve to the west of us, the Talamati Pride, with S8, the male lion, also sitting on the reserve to the west of us. So not any lion action in this part of the world, and those buffalo we had went off towards the east. So I'm afraid we are on our own here, and I think our best chance 
of seeing some big game animals must surely be a leopard because if there are no lions around well then the leopards like to hang about as do the wild dogs I haven't heard reports of wild dogs in the three weeks that I've been here actually Hello Brandon, you're 10 years old and you're wondering how I can tell which way the leopard's going. Well, it's it's just like if you were walking along a beach and a dog had walked along the beach, you'd be able to tell which direction that dog was walking because you can tell which way its foot faces. So you can tell the front of a foot from the back of a foot. I mean, in the case of a dog, it's got claws in the front. but you know, if you've looked at the bottom of a dog's foot, you know exactly which way is frontwards and which way is backwards. And so that's how you tell which way a leopard's going. We can tell which is the front and which is the back of the track, and so we know which way it's walking. Uh, the only, I suppose, uh, consideration to that is that um, the leopard may be walking backwards, um, but I've never seen a leopard walk backwards, so I think if you can tell the front from, of the track from the back of the track you could know which way it's traveling. So our plan from here, we've come all the way to the northeast, is to head back into the sort of central regions back towards the waterhole near camp and see if we can't pick up on more of the tracks that old Sedders had. I think both of those buffalo herds have crossed out of Juma so we won't be seeing them any time soon. Mm. Sedas has managed to find himself a beard, so let's go across there as quick as we can. Thank you, James. Yes, no, it's uh, so far a little bit unsuccessful with uh, tracking the, these leopards down this morning. Um, I know that that female leopard looks like um, came up towards Tumbeta House and then cut maybe through towards this area. So I did come down towards uh, where Treehouse Dam is. That's exactly where I am now. Um, on my way down, yeah, I did pop my nose in as well as the what you call the Ahina Den, the Juma Clan Den site. Unfortunately. Nobody, nobody's home. There is tracks of a hyena back and forth there, so I'm sure June has been back, uh, back at the den site, and then she moved off again. So, but I'll keep my eyes open for that den site to see if we can get any activity again, maybe later on this morning. But yes, it's, it's, we're sitting here now with a blacksmith lapwing, and uh, I know that this uh, this pair of lapwings around here, Treehouse Dam, have been quite successful when they were raising their little chicks. I think both times. I think last year and the beginning of this year, they last year they raised two chicks and they both got to adulthood and they moved off. And then I think in the beginning of this year, there was another two chicks and they got to adulthood and also moved off. So these lapwings have been really successful here at Treehouse Dam. So I'm just waiting to see if they are going to be nesting again. It should be very soon. It should be now June, July. So they should start um, start nesting once again and usually having about three three eggs in a clutch. Always roaming around on the water edge. Stormy, no, it's just mostly, most, uh, most of the birds will go into, like, especially the males, the males will get the breeding plumage, uh, not the females, but the males will get the uh, breeding plumage. So if you're looking at something like your, the, the widers, um, you know, they get that long tail uh, during breeding season. Uh, the males will go, get, go into that beautiful red color or the yellow color. Um, so they'll get the breeding plumage, um, but uh, not a, not most of, most of the females, they don't have the breeding plumage, but it's just the males. So yeah, I'm trying to think if there is a female that will go into breeding plumage. Like getting the colors and, you know, extended tails. You know, it's just really the males. But of course, when it comes to your blacksmith lappings, 
they don't have, they'll just pretty much be in adult plumage and that's about it. So they'll just really have that black, white and grey colour to them. But they don't really have to show off because they're pretty much monogamous, uh, these lapwings. So they will be partners for life around. Martin Pied, why is it called Pied, black and white? Martin is just, you know, like I thought, like how I understand it, it's like a, like a graph, you know, you get a Pied graph. So the Pied graph is usually, of course, you've got your colored, your black and white uh, graphed, and that's where the Pied comes from. So I don't know, maybe it's a Greek word. It's a Greek word? Could be Pied. Or Latin, yeah. Maybe it's a Latin word, Pied. So yeah, that's it. But I know like they've got a pied graft and of course then of course coming through to the bird side of things, you'll have of course your pied barbet, pied crows, pied kingfishers. So yeah, I think it's I think yeah, I think it is Latin. It must be Latin. And you can see these old blacksmith lapwings. They are just enjoying a little bit of uh, all the water arthropods here. Enjoying a good old early morning meal. And well, we can continue just searching around, just see if we can locate maybe that female leopard. And while we do that, let's head over to Tess. I hope you find a female leopard set, that would be awesome. That's a very good adventure, good luck. On this side we found one of the things we were wanting to show you at least. A whole herd of black wildebeest walking almost in single file. Moving from a cold valley up towards the sun. You can see the sun is just hitting the crest behind them. So I think they are excited and ready to start warming up. It is freezing cold in this valley. And it's not even a proper valley that we're in, it's a little dip. Maybe a five meter difference maximum from the crest behind us and we have already put on extra layers just sitting here with the wildebeest. I think they had a cold night. Shockingly close to that cheetah as well. That cheetah is literally just off to the left somewhere. I'm quite surprised that they had such a relaxed night and that they all survived. Although, I suppose the cheetahs have an ostrich, so quite a large meal. But this is a pretty sizable herd of black wildebeest. Very distinctive white fluffy tails, almost that pied coloration. And I'm actually thinking about it now. I don't remember where the name pied comes from, do you, Eagle? From a bakery somewhere. <laughs> it's too early in the morning for shenanigans. <laughs> From bakery somewhere. Ooh, are we having a little dust bath? That's exciting. Stylish, yes. Unfortunately for these black wildebeest, the white tail is very noticeable and distinctive, so it does make them quite obvious to predators. But that being said, I don't really think wildebeest can hide that well. They are so dark, and I mean, even that mane, that will definitely make them stand out. So they don't really camouflage much. They don't have those stripes down their sides like a blue wildebeest does that might allow them to camouflage a bit. Black wildebeest just literally stick to the clearing, so they're going to be spotted anyway. They don't bother to spend energy on camouflage. They just run like the clappers. They have got ridiculously high stamina. And so if they see a predator coming, because they rely on an open clearing, they even give birth in big open clearings like this. They won't go to the thickets like other antelopes will. They rely on the fact that they're hopefully going to see something before it gets too close and then they just run and they keep running and keep running and keep running but they can also be pretty aggressive I mean I'm sure you can imagine 
these wildebeest that look so hardcore, those horns facing forwards, these huge manes on the top of their necks, they really can be quite scary. So that's their tactic, fight or flight, in the truest sense of the, the phrase, I suppose. Oh, look, the sun is reaching them now. It's amazing how fast it's rising. Can you see how the ones in the sun have already stopped to start feeding? It's just this one in the shade that's going absolutely wild with a pile of dirt. <laughs> Everyone else is going to start warming up and this one is just adamant. I will mess up this patch of dirt. <laughs> you see so much energy. <laughs> this is why I love black wildebeest. The adults play, which is not something we see in many species. They get so playful and boisterous. But I mean, look at how those, those white tails are glowing in the sun. Looks like you've put a little lantern on their butts. It's like a follow me sign, but everything will see that. So they don't really use camouflage an awful lot. A hundred percent if they lie down, they're quite well hidden, but they don't really lie down that much. <laughs> they move a lot. <laughs> Oh, Laura Moore, I'm glad to hear that you are enamored by the wildebeest. I am such a huge fan of the black wildebeest. I feel like any time that I get to spend with them, I'm seeing something different. I'm, I've got a smile on my face the whole time because they're just so different. They look different. They act different. They're just captivating to watch. There's always something happening. What are those two to the right doing? Oh, I think they were having a bit of a shoving match. They stopped now. They moved off into the sun. Wow. It's like everyone has become statues now. Soak up the sun. Catherine, probably the antelope with the most stamina for long distances would be, I would say, maybe the Hartebeest. They're really well known for having stamina. How did it be in Blesbuck? There's actually a Blesbuck in this group. It's just really well hidden. See if you can spot it at some point. It's not quite with that group, but there is a Blesbuck around. Um, but because they've got that very similar shape to something like a spotted hyena, the sloped back, so the hips sit lower than the shoulders and that allows them to get into this like galloping gait and once they're going that momentum just keeps throwing them forward and they can keep their stamina really well so probably the the overall species that are really good with stamina for long distances would be blue and black wildebeest but black wildebeest i would think more than blue wildebeest and then hartebeest whether it's red hartebeest or lichtenstein's hartebeest and then blessback those for me would be the, the species that have the most stamina. It is tough to tell though, because as an overall species, I think people rate the Hartebeest as one of the most hardcore in terms of stamina. But if you've got a Blessbuck or a Black Wildebeest with an excessive will to live and it's not going to give up, any particular circumstance might cause it to have more stamina than a Hartebeest. It just depends on the day, it depends on the individual animal the circumstances, how badly it wants to fight for its life. We've got another mud bath happening. Hello. <laughs> Are you having a good time? Coating yourself in dust for the day. Wildebeest version of a bubble bath. some very strange noises. I can hear a helicopter but I'm also hearing I don't know if that was maybe zebras having a panic or if it was just a lot of crows because we're so close to where that ostrich was killed that there's probably quite a few crows around. I am interested to see uh, I was gonna say how the wildebeest react to the presence of a chopper there we go that explains it. 
There is the blessed back clear as day now. <laughs> Everybody's getting their run on. At least you can see an example of some stamina and speed. Oh, and they're calling. I love that call. You would never expect that to come from something as big and scary looking as a wildebeest. <laughs> it's like a little, like a little squeaky tree frog. <laughs> Jared in my ear, my lovely director in Johannesburg, he thought that somebody had hiccups, whether it was me or Igor, I don't know, but he thought one of us had hiccups, he didn't know that that was a wildebeest call. Jared, I must tell you, the first time I ever heard the black wildebeest here make a noise, I was with Morgan, and I think I had the solid giggles for about an hour. I couldn't help myself because you do not expect that call to come from these big wildebeest, right? It's so weird. And then the other call is that weird. <sighs> it kills me. It's so good. <laughs> it is so, so good. Well, the wildebeest are gone. It's because there is a chopper in the area. That's right though. Sometimes there has to be in terms of conservation and ecology to be done effectively. But at least we know how they react to a chopper. The chopper's actually about to come in from the left, so you might even see it. All right, so I'm heading now onto the western side. We're gonna still try to follow up on that uh, female leopard. Um, as I said, I wasn't gonna continue trying to uh, track down Mulawati. You know, Mulawati is just one of those males that, you know, I think we got so used to certain males here in the Northern Sands um, being very relaxed. I mean, back in the days we had uh, Mafufunyan. I mean, Mafufunyan was a very relaxed male. I mean, he was just one of those males that uh, I think he always just wanted to be seen all the time. Uh, then we also had Mvula. I mean, Mvula was one of the, another male exactly like my Fufinian. He was my first big male I saw here in the northern Sabi Sands and he was also very relaxed. And then you looked at uh, Tingana. Tingana relaxed. Well, he started off a little bit kind of uh, shy in the way, but he became relaxed very quickly. So uh, Tingana became a good, uh, a good male to view. And like, of course, we could spend such quality time with those uh, leopards because they wouldn't disappear and unfortunately like Molawati is just being a leopard you know that's the thing Molawati is just being a leopard I think Molawati is just knowing that you know he doesn't want to be seen and there was another male like that many years ago yeah in the northern Sabi Sands and that was Jordan and Jordan was exact the same Jordan used to be if you saw Jordan it was you know he would go behind one or two other bushes and then he would just slink away and uh, you, you won't see him so he was one of those males who hardly ever got to get you know get nice photos of and spend time with only time you could spend time with the males like that is if they had uh cubs you know with their they're with a the female and they're with the cubs and the female and that and i had times like that with uh who was it mishu induna karula and Jordan in one sighting and he was very relaxed at that time so that just shows you it's uh it depends on the situation but uh what do you mean, Molawati is just, <laughs> he's, the, he's the ghost of Juma. And uh, he, you know, if he doesn't want to be seen, he will not be seen. I mean, we were like fortunate the other night there, we sat with Nsumi, of course. Uh, Bushman, yes, I think Tristan and uh, Michael Fleetwood, um, they were there in Little Gowrie the other day. I think it was about four days ago, four, I think about four days ago where they had Langa and Marips uh, um, in the same tree, at the same sighting. So that was in Little Gowrie, that was about four days ago. So, but we didn't see him, of course, as I said, we don't traverse there, but uh, Michael Fleetwood uh, was with Tristan and them and they got to see him uh, that side. So yes, so it just shows you, it's, it's uh, yeah, he's still around. 
I thought it might have been him that had that uh, altercation with uh, Molawati this morning because I, mean, I heard about I heard about it. I think some of the viewers that was watching Dam Cam said it might be Marips. But then I found a, a female leopard track there and a, and a big male. So, you know, it's, but that's just, maybe it could be around. It could be around. I mean, I'm not going to say he's not here. He's, he might be around here. So, yeah, that's why I say I'm going to head up to. So I head back to Gary Dam and just go look around, just scratch around that area because there is, there is the, the leopards are here, the leopards are here, that's, that's, that's a given, you know, but they might be in the block, you know, might have to do a little bit of uh, footwork to really um, try and locate them, but yeah, we'll see. But as I said, I mean like, <laughs> We got so used to big male leopards and we could spend great times with them, quality times with them and put them on screen and sit with them for a while and enjoy, you know, and just enjoy their per their characters, their personalities and that. Uh, yeah, we can enjoy Molo Hwati's personality to a degree, but I think, yeah, <laughs> what, we, what we see of it, yeah, that's, that's anything, but it's all right. All right, well, I'm going up on uh, Zoe's. I'm just doing Zoe's going back to Gary Dam sides. Well, I just want to do this road just in case. Oh, Tony Tutos, what's the uh, longest leopard that I've known that has held a territory? One like that. But anyway, yeah. Um, well, look, I know that in Vula, yes, you. Oh, okay, now I have to think about that. That's difficult. No, not in Ghana. Um, Vula was 20, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Six, six years? Vula was about six years. Six, about six years. So I might, be, I might be wrong here, but then again, then look at my Fufinian. My, my Fufinian was, sure, my Fufinian was from 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So yeah, look, six, seven years. I'll say about six, seven years. That's a, that's a, a male's like time when they hold a territory. It's about six, seven years. Um, I can't think of somebody else that's been that held a territory much longer than that. See so that those are the like, males that I I know. Um, so there might be some other male that's done it a little bit longer, but it, it, it'll make sense because a male will become territorial at about, say, say four years old. They become territorial at four years old and they'll have a territory up to about maybe 10, 11 years old. And see, when they get to about 13, 14, they get too old. So it's usually between six, seven, eight years that they'll hold a territory. That's if they can, you know, that's if, uh, you know, there's, there's not much pressure on them keeping that area, you know, so. I'm sure it's, other areas will be different. I've got a feeling maybe sometimes you'll find around drainage lines, not big uh, drainage lines, like rivers, big rivers, the Sabi River, the Sand River, Woolly Funds, Lataba, those big river systems, of course, a prime, prime habitat for leopards. And um, I think there the pressure is just way higher on uh, keeping a territory. Maybe that, you know, for them keeping a territory like at that time is going to be much shorter. But yeah, so I'll just know these ones about six, seven years. Anyway, while well, we're going to continue up towards Gary Dam, let's head it over to Andrew in Pridelands as he's got some impalas to show you. Thanks for that, Cedric. Very nice, very nice piece, that. We're watching some impalas here by Impala Plains. We did come across male leopard tracks uh, just uh, south of our direction over here. So we're just circling a few blocks just to see if we can't pick up trails again. And then if we can't maybe even find the animals. So we're trying our luck. We don't have Morris, so I'm putting my skills to the test. And Panda is also very good spotting some of the tracks that have already crossed the road as well. So together we are hoping. But in case uh, you weren't with us yesterday evening with the Sunset Safari, um, we spoke about these impalas over here and uh, we heard them alarm calling yesterday evening and uh, we believe that lions were in this nearby area. This morning we got reports that there's been some alarm calling more or less here where we are. 
uh, of monkeys and guinea fowl. And that was early this morning before we set out. And then we set out on our drive and we came up here, sort of tracking a little bit, and we've come up here. And uh, we got word from the eco-training students who are with one of the instructors, Andre, and uh, they mentioned that they heard these very impalas alarming. So we're just checking around here, keeping our, our wits about us and hoping to find leopard this morning. But yeah, Panda looked at me this morning and I looked at him and he even said to me, he says, this feels like a sort of a leopardy type of a morning, just the way the sun was rising and uh, just the way the air felt. Beautiful. Yeah, but speaking about eco-training and instructors and all of that, uh, we want to play you a quick video so that you can understand exactly um, the different sort of types of courses you can do. This specific one is called the Eco Digital Course. Let's take a look at this. Hi, I'm Debbie from Pretoria. Hello, my name is Maurice. I am from Perth in Western Australia. Hello, I'm Stefan. As you can hear, I am French and I'm doing the 35 days uh, online course. I started watching Wild Earth during COVID. I decided that I wanted to study more. And in order to do that, I saw that Eco Training Friedlands um, was doing courses and I decided to do the eight week online theory course at the end of last year. So the 35 days course, it basically starts with the theory online, uh, three sessions a week, very enjoyable. We went really, really deep into it, uh, very holistic as well. I uh, really enjoyed it. It goes from insects to stars to obviously your mammals and your birds. I liked the, the two components. Uh, it just got me really well prepared before I got here. Despite my accents and my misunderstandings, Everyone has been very helpful and uh, comprehensive to help me to understand everything. The in instructors that uh, we've had so far, they're all just fabulous. Uh, they're absolutely some of the most experienced people in the field. I can definitely uh, recommend it to, uh, to other people, uh, especially when you're living far away. Whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out on your journey towards becoming a conservationist, our digital courses offer a flexible and accessible way to deepen your knowledge and understanding of the natural world. So why wait? Sign up for an eco-training digital course today with the promo code to receive 200 Rand off. Now, we're still watching these uh, Impala and uh, two of them are really becoming a little bit starey in the distance. But if you have a look at sort of the composition of this, uh, this specific group of Impala, you'll notice that they are quite huddled at the moment. Even though they're feeding and some of them are, looks like they're quite relaxed, they are in a huddled motion. So we know that something was concerning them um, quite recently. So this, uh, I believe, is a hot spot area. And I do believe there's a leopard somewhere in this block over here. Beautiful morning with some birds that are calling. I heard a black-headed oriole just moments ago. This <whistles> sort of a sound. And in the far distance, the Aramark babblers. Sean, that's a good question. That's a very good question. You know, I think it's a combination of two things. I think leopard movements are based on their competition. That's a big one. They, they've got to, got, to, got to know their competition and sort of know how to move around that if the competition is too great, like lions and so on. And then also prey. They're going to go where the prey goes. You see what I mean? Within their territory. If there was no impalas around here, say that uh, the impalas became very scarce, you would find that the leopards would very much change their territories to accommodate the fact that they're going to need food in their territory. And that's one of the reasons why leopards do have fairly big territories, is because one of the reasons is, can you imagine when they're hunting? They're hunting these, say, these impala over here, and the impalas take off running, and they try some other impala, you know, further on. Soon enough, it's a, a, an area within their territory becomes totally spooked. Everything is now on high alert and uh, ready to fleet on the hoof. But a very interesting question. Thank you for that. Oh, Tess has got some playful jackals in Amakala. We're going to send you off there.
is this thing we found a pair of jackals having absolute ball in a rhino midden. <laughs> it just shows you the kind of bond that jackal pairs have. It's absolutely brilliant. One of the most important things for jackals in particular. They're luckily so, so playful this morning. <laughs> now one of them has a short tail, so it's taking it out on the other one's tail. I'm gonna bite your tail, because I don't have one. <laughs> that is gorgeous. Oh, I got some poo. <laughs> it's just enjoy. It's just watch this unfold. That's exactly what that one in the same spot was doing to that little mouse that it caught the other day, whatever rat or rodent it got. That was adorable. Oh, Waikisha, how cute was that? That was a very special little treat, seeing them in and around this rhino midden. And I do find it interesting, this is probably somewhere that they've come and played before. It's probably somewhere right in the middle of their territory, slap bang in the middle. I'm going to see if I can reposition, purely because I can still see movement. Let's see if we can sneak in forwards and dip into the sun. Yes, I can still see them. Let's see if we can catch them playing again. They are so cute. We have set a new target. Join us as we strive to reach our next donation goal of 11,000 US dollars by the end of June. If we succeed, get ready for an unforgettable survival special in one of our sunset safaris. Witness the incredible skills of Steve and Lauren as they tackle challenging tasks like building shelter, making fire, and finding water and food. Donate now and be a part of Wild Earth's first survival challenge.
All right, I'm on the open clearing now at the moment. I just as I as I um, came live now, I just spotted a a hibiscus, a wild hibiscus. So with this wild hibiscus, it's actually nice because the grass is nice and wet here as well. So and very sticky. Oh, all right. But I can see uh, with this wild hibiscus, it's got this beautiful, beautiful yellow petals. And of course, then right in the center, it's got this beautiful maroon color as well. So this kind of uh, plant or this flower mainly gets uh, pollinated through a certain beetle called the, of course, the blister beetle or the blister bug. So they do enjoy the wild hibiscus. But it's quite a few, there is quite a few of them around here. So what the local people do with this wild hibiscus, so I'm just going to take one little petal off here. I'm just going to take one little petal off, see if I can get it properly here. And what they do, they'll take, if they're going like to a, a wedding or something like that, they'll actually grab this maroon part and they'll use this as almost like a makeup. So they use this as like blush or like lipstick. So what you do, you just take that little bit of yellow petals away. All right, you're ready. Let's see if it's going to work. So. It's got, it's got a very slimy feel to it, so I just want to see if it's going to... Can you see it, uh, Owen? <laughs> if I can get it onto my face. Alright, so I'm going to try and smear this... Uh... Uh, is it coming off? Not really. <laughs> yeah, well that's exactly so, but you, if you take a whole lot of, but you actually have to dry it out first apparently and then you grab it and you can actually use it and you put like lipstick or you put like blush and the local people will do that when they go to like weddings or like you know some event and that and they don't have anything with them but then they'll go for the wild hibiscus. So it's a nice thing to use, <laughs> I can't see why, I thought it's going to come off a little bit but it's going, my, actually my finger is going quite purple, you can see it's, it's going like that purple colour. So, of course, if uh, you'll find as soon as you can um, and dry these things out, I think it's going to work a little bit better. I think if I'll find a dry one. But unfortunately, all right, unfortunately, it's very wet here. And this is one of the areas, yeah, like you don't want to drive off, go off-roading here. So, because this water is just so, so, um, I can say it's saturated this area quite a bit. So, I think there's a lot of uh, granite that's sitting underneath here, almost like a seep line. So yes, if you've got like a sea plane, what happens? Granite underneath and the water sits above and of course this, uh, the grass stays quite damp and quite mushy for quite some time. But anyway, while we're going to continue towards Gary Dam, let's head over to Lauren in Medikwe as she's doing some birding. have one of the more fabulous birds around here. No! <laughs> okay. We have been sitting here for about 10 minutes with them. And we had lines on a kill. But sadly, no signal. So say la vie, pussycat. We shall keep bumbling. That was a female yellow-throated sand, sand grouse. The male was just behind her. But we're not winning this morning. lions were eating a zebra so we have come to the plains now as our next port of call and we are just really scanning around to see any signs of mama cheetah and her three little ones so far no luck but you have to drive slowly it's really it's quite vast here and of course if they are flat you're never going to spot them so it's best just to drive slowly and see if you might get that head pop up and that's really what you're looking for. But they were around yesterday, so I'm just hoping that we're gonna be in luck today. It's amazing when the sun is at a specific height as well, it becomes really difficult to actually see. But wish us luck, everyone. Hopefully we'll find our spots and you guys are gonna go over to Tess. I'd love to see those cheetah cubs. Good luck, good luck, good luck. I hope you bring us all the fluffy cuteness. On this side, we are having a ridiculously lucky morning. We are just 
ticking off all the things we were hoping to find this morning. In fact, the only things we've not found from our list of things we wanted to see this morning are zebras and cheetahs. But we've got a secretary bird. That is 100% something we always want to see, but specifically we wanted to catch up with them today because there's no wind, it's nice and sunny, and they should be exactly like this one, out and about getting ready to hunt. How cool would it be to see this secretary bird hunting? Now it is deceiving, you can't see how tall this bird actually is from standing like that while it's busy preening its feathers. But it would take me pretty much up to my hip height if I was to stand next to it. And I'm not a short human either. So these are pretty massive birds and ferocious predators. Oof. I'm imagining this so many years ago as a dinosaur version. Wow, that must have been terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. And what a gorgeous bird this is. I don't know where the other one is. I'm not sure if this is... Well, we saw two yesterday, I think. Separate spots. I'm not sure which one of those two this is, or if it's a third one. But we're right in the middle of where we saw the two yesterday, so it's a little confusing. <coughs> Sorry, excuse my cough. But I can tell you this is most likely one of the members of a nesting pair in the area. There seems to be a lot of action in this particular section of Amakala recently. So you can definitely tell why it would be a favorite spot for us to come and have a look what we can find when we scratch around. Wow, that is so beautiful. Tina, we've been thinking about that a lot and in fact I was busy chatting about it a bit yesterday saying I wonder if it's because in a slightly shorter tree or even a large bush or shrub they can camouflage the nest better because if I'm thinking about an eagle's nest it's normally fairly obvious it's such a huge stick nest high up in a tree and to me <laughs> we've spotted some hardy dogs hang on i'll get back to the question now spice if you're watching you've been asking me to show you hardy dog ibises <laughs> that's them flying away and making a noise hardy dog ibis we had to show you because you've been asking we'll try and show you a close-up view of one that's actually sitting still so you can see the metallic sheen and actually get an idea of the shape but those are hardy dogs specifically for spice Spas has been asking me to try and find some in Amakala. Thank you, Igor. Um, so back to the secretary bird nest. <laughs> so to me, if I think of an eagle's nest high up in a tree, you can spot it. It's this huge stick nest structure. It's normally quite messy. It catches your eye. So it'll catch everyone's eye. All the other birds of prey and everything like that. Now, I suppose it is different having a bird's eye view. Flying over the top of the shrub, you'd still be able to see a secretary bird's nest. But from the side, the only reason we know that there are nests where they are is because we can see the secretary bird sitting in it when it's sitting up. So I wonder if it's not something to do with camouflage and protection. You'd probably also find that they might nest in larger trees elsewhere, but there aren't that many large trees here. But secretary birds in particular are really well known for using all the different acacia species. I'm saying acacia in inverted commas. They are no longer called acacias here in South Africa. It's either Vicelia or Senegalia. But they really have an affinity for umbrella thorns and black thorns, sweet thorns. So here it's majority going to be sweet thorn, even black wattle. They have an affinity for that. And I would imagine it's a combination of being really dense with thorns and leaves so it's a well protected and sheltered nest it's dipped down into the top so that it's sheltered for the chicks from the wind not so much from the sun because there's not really foliage above it but at the same time maybe the thorns kind of give them a bit of an advantage to wedge the sticks in from that stick nest and keep them safe but it could also have something to do with for example the fact that they're bringing back 
quite a lot of prey and they're not they're not like the other eagles they spend a lot of time on the ground where other eagles perch themselves high up in trees i mean this is technically the biggest raptor that we have but all the other raptors spend their time perched in trees swoop down and go straight back up where a secretary bird is on the floor a lot so if it's on the ground and it catches something it just hops onto the top of the bush drops it off hops back down so it's a shorter distance to cover back to the ground because they don't hunt by flying around and looking for things <coughs> excuse me they hunt by walking along the floor looking and listening for movement and then they pounce on things with their feet so it's probably a combination of that kind of camouflage plus the hunting styles and technique the fact that they spend most of their time on the floor and a nice amount of shelter for the chicks Oh, Darcy Miller, I knew you'd be excited to see the secretary bird this morning. They are such gorgeous birds. I really like that yellow sear around the eye. Yellowy orange. It's such a striking bird. Even just the color of its feathers, you know, it's not your typical gray and black mix. It is so distinctive. And that very messy crest on the top of the head. Very, very, very pretty bird. So you can actually kind of tell if you've got two secretary birds next to each other. The adults, I hear more hardy does. <laughs> the adults are the ones with orange around their eyes where the, the youngsters, the juveniles, start off with the yellow and then it kind of transitions over to orange. So soon enough, that's going to become quite important when these ones have chicks and we start seeing the chicks leave the nest. When they start getting to almost adult size, it can be quite difficult to tell the difference between them because they look almost identical except for that little patch of colour around the eye. Oh, we are having a proper grooming session this morning. It is too early for hunting. We shall groom first. <laughs> Murray, that's actually a very interesting observation. You're saying you can't believe that a Cory Bustard is heavier than a secretary bird. Do you know how much a secretary bird weighs? Just for interest's sake, because it's only around four kilograms. They are very lightweight because they've got such long legs. And actually their body's quite small underneath all of those feathers. They only weigh about four kilograms. A Cory Bustard is three times heavier. It's over 12 kilograms. <laughs> so it's a, it's a lot more bulky. A Cory Bustard is very bulky. It's interesting though because a Cory Bustard is shorter than a secretary bird. So the secretary bird is kind of the tall, thin frame, slender. And the Cory Bustard is a smidge shorter. Literally it can be anywhere from 5 to 20 centimeters shorter. But it's much more stocky. Much, much, much more stocky. It is interesting though, because you wouldn't really think that when you look at them. But it's, I suppose, even similar to an ostrich. They look like these humongous, chunky birds, which they are. I mean, a big male can be 90 kilograms. But actually, if you were to take the feathers off, they look quite strange, because the feathers make them look a lot bigger than they are. They look quite funny without feathers. Speaking of ostrich, we did actually go past the area where that cheetah was yesterday with the ostrich kill. Not a sign of anything other than crows that flew off. We can't find the ostrich carcass. It must have been dragged into the bushes, but there were brown hyena tracks and a ton of jackal tracks. So I imagine that young male cheetah got chased off that carcass or possibly left before any chasing was necessary. And that carcass has been completely moved or finished off. Probably a combination of both. Some of it's still left, but that has been moved because of all the fighting over the scraps of food. And the rest has been finished. But I suppose we'll just have to try and find the cheetahs now and figure out where they've gone. We're doing our second dam segment, everybody, but it's a different dam, even though the last time you saw us, we were at a dam. And the reason you haven't seen us for some time is that A, we haven't found anything, and B, I've managed to bend a tie rod underneath the car while following up on some alarm calling Franklins. 
and that means that we've been trying to fix it, failing dismally, and we're now drifting back to camp, limping back to camp, where we are hopefully going to fix our tie rod. So that is the update from Wendy. Wendy is the vehicle we are sitting on, in case you were wondering. Oh, uh, Gerrit has spotted a grey heron. Well done, Gerrit. That is the sum total of our achievements today. Once again, we went out feeling a great sense of hope because of the interactions that took place here at the dam camp last night, only to have our hopes dashed. Just in case you were thinking that Cedric and I are particularly incompetent, uh, well, which you probably weren't, I mean, you haven't accused us of that. I just sometimes feel like uh, we're not finding enough cats. You will be pleased, perhaps, to know that uh, Tristan, who is guiding to the south of us, hasn't seen a cat for two days either. So, you know, it's just a bit of a dry time currently. Luckily, uh, our dear colleagues at Amakala and Madikwe and Pridelands have managed to find quite a few kitties over the last couple of days. There's just been a bit of a dearth here at Juma. But the cycle will turn, the wheel will turn, and the cycle shall return. The, the wheel will turn, and the cycle will complete. The cycle will come around again, will cycle, yes, will the cycle will complete. I don't know how to describe that. What does a cycle do? The cycle will return. Well, tur I, I don't know. Anyway, we're going to nip back to camp and, <laughs> and sort this out. Those are some water thick knees, which is very nice. Hopefully we'll see you again with a straight tie rod in not too very long from now. <laughs> I, uh, I had, uh, it must be Tlalamba, it must be Tlalamba because from, uh, from Gary Dam to the Tumbeta, uh, Tumbeta house and I went along towards the Bushpry area, the uh, Juma Bushpry and her tracks is all on top of my vehicle tracks coming into this block here now behind us, so not long ago. So we're not too far behind uh, that female leopard. She must be here somewhere. I'm just going to quickly, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to do a little bit of a loop around and uh, go. There's an, I know there's a... Water. Every cell that makes up the wonders of our natural history needs this life-sustaining molecule. Sometimes in tiny amounts, sometimes in torrents, our blue planet flush with biological wonders would be a desolate, lifeless place without miraculous H2O. Alrighty, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry about that. You've lost Cedric. I think he's around here somewhere, he said. Let me get hold of him on the radio. Cedric, do you copy? We are just going back that way, so we thought we'd just do a little detour and see if we don't get lucky. We might be lucky and bump into the leopard. Who knows? We won't be able to follow it off-road if we do get lucky. But still. Mvubu Road. That's a good, that's a good thought. I said to Jarrett, what road's he on? And Jarrett said, I don't know, he's on something called Mshugu or Mfubu or something like that. Hello, Mandy. 
You're getting hold of us all the way from Tasmania. And you're wondering what the word Sabi Sands means. Well, Mandy, Sabi Sands doesn't actually mean anything. But it derives from the confluence of two rivers. Please excuse my appalling Australian accent. I'll stop. Mandy, the two rivers are the Sabi and the Sand River, and the Sand River is a tributary of the Sabi, and the Sabi is the southern boundary of the Sabi Sands, and the Sand River sort of cuts through the middle of it, and that's why it's called the Sabi Sands Game Reserve. <laughs> Tasmania. My, um, my good wife has got a auntie who lives in Tasmania, Outside Hobart. Doesn't everybody live outside Hobart? I should probably go and spend some time there so I can improve my Australian accent. Ah. Thank you, Betty. You say you love my photos and you want to know what camera and lenses I use. Betty, I use the Sony A7... Oh, Zeti, with a Z. Zeti, I use a Sony A7 IV, which is a mid-range... It's not a mid-cost, because no camera equipment costs is cheap, but it's a mid-range sort of semi-professional camera. Uh, mirrorless camera and then most most of the time I have a 200 to 600 millimeter lens attached to the front of it so it's a big long lens and yeah it's a nice setup it's certainly not top of the range but it is it's it's perfectly adequate for for what I do um, yeah I, I think that I, I do think that the color you know it, it, uh, people say to me, what brand of camera should I get? And I say, it doesn't really matter because these, the, um, uh, the these camera brands leapfrog each other. So Nikon will make a great camera one year and then Canon will make a better one and then Sony will make a better one and then Fuji might make a better one after that and then Panasonic will do the same. So they kind of leapfrog each other. So really what I say to people is you, you're going to whatever glass you buy, whatever lenses you buy, that's the kind of camera you're going to buy and then you're going to have to upgrade it every so often. So, but, I do say, I do think that the color rendition on the Sony uh, is slightly superior, in my opinion, to some of the others that I've seen, but it doesn't make a massive difference. Okay, we're nearly at camp, we haven't found a leopard, we're hopefully going to find a tie rod, you're going to go to Tessa, who's doing some birding. Thank you, James. Good luck on that side. On this side, we finally got a close-up view of some hardy da ibises for spice. A very interesting looking bird, don't you think? And now you can actually see the glossy sheen as well down the side of the wing. Nice break from that dull gray coloration along the neck and the back. A very pretty glossy greeny purple shining through on those wings. Now this is the famous cheetah tree of Amakala, yet there are no cheetahs, we've got hardy dars instead. So we were having a very successful morning and then, alas, we found hardy dars on a cheetah tree. But <laughs> at least I suppose we get to show you a close-up view of something on this tree, it's always nice. Always important. Now the hardy dar ibis is one of five, no, four, one, two, three, four, four different species of hardy, of, of not of hardy dog. Wow, let me try that again. The hardy dog ibis is one of four ibis species. It's the most common one we get here, but we also get the African sap sacred ibis, which is the white and black one. Quite a large one and very pretty. And then there's also the glossy ibis and the southern bald ibis, but I have never, ever seen a southern bald ibis. And I think I've seen a glossy ibis we do get them here, but I've seen one maybe two or three times. We don't get to see them all together that often. But I think it's also very easy to confuse a glossy ibis with a hardy dot ibis. They are quite similar, but the glossy ibis has a lot more red and the 
tip of the bill is very curved compared to this one which is slightly straighter. Now this is one of Igor's favorite birds. <laughs> uh, James, that's an interesting one. I, I do think that they would be able to smell predators, but I don't think they rely on smell. I think they rely on the fact that they can perch high up in a tree and see movement. I think that they're mostly using their eyes more than anything. Birds are exceptionally well known for having very good eyesight. They've also got pretty decent hearing too. Um, so I think they rely on that before they rely on smell more than anything. But, I mean, you never know. You never know. I think for them, they're very nervous birds. They are exceptionally well known for fleeing long before they will even try and fight. So any movement and they'll fly. And in fact, I can hear a vehicle coming close. I wonder if they're going to fly off or if they're going to be brave enough to stick it out with a whole second vehicle coming to look at them. Oh my goodness. Oh, we've already got some movement. <laughs> Kathy Lee, that's a very good point. Igor is exceptionally good at following birds on the wing. And it definitely is all that time in the bay, I'm sure. Flightless, yes. Yeah. Penguins are flightless. That's a very good point. But you did have darters and cormorants and gannets and all of those things, so I suppose that helps. There are a lot of beautiful seabirds. In fact, Igor and I were talking about this, oh, there it goes, talking about this the other day because um, he hasn't really visited Port Alfred, where, where I'm from and where, where my family is. And we were chatting about the different sea life that we find there because, of course, Igor is exceptionally interested in marine life and I am as well but not nearly as much as Igor and I'm not nearly as well educated on marine life as Igor. So we were chatting about the possibility of dolphins and orcas, penguins, we get penguins there as well which is pretty cool. A lot of cape gannets, huge birds, darters and cormorants, some really interesting marine life. A hardy dar is quite different to all of those marine birds let me tell you. This one this one, actually, you know what, Eagle, this has got a really interesting, this has got a really interesting uh, closed little circle for you, Eagle. Do you know why? Because okay. you said your spirit animal is an earthworm and a hardy dog eats an earthworm. Now I know why you like hardy dogs so much. <sighs> it's, a, it's a very interesting little neat bow to tie in your story <laughs> since you're so sarcastic all the time this is why he loves hardy dars because they are huge fans of digging holes in the ground and picking up earthworms <laughs> oh, what an interesting turn of events for the day <laughs> oh listen there's others calling Can you hear them calling? That's amazing. There's some other ones calling somewhere. That's the call of a hardy dar. Isn't it loud? I'm surprised these ones haven't called back. <laughs> but anyway, Spuss, I'm super happy we could show you some hardy dars and I'm hoping that you enjoyed it. We'll send you over to Lauren to see what she's got for you in Madikwe. Someone's just woke up, and it's not me or Darby. It's a little bit late. It's quarter past eight. I understand why you don't want to leave your burrow. It's a nice burrow system. I'm hoping that other little heads are going to pop up soon. But very similar to dwarf mongoose in that there will be those squirrels that come out and just scan around first. Hello, good morning. Yes, you do have pillow face, but that's okay, it's cute. Oh. 
you know, forget to turn the game drive radio off because it's so quiet. And then, of course, the minute we go live. There's a borough system that we managed to show you really b briefly the other week that has ground squirrels and bandied mongoose together. And that is such a rare, amazing sighting that Davi and I keep going back, but it's in a really tricky signal spot. And this is my way, so sometimes we win, sometimes we don't. But it's so unusual to see that. Definitely a first for me. Ah, oh, there's another one coming out and stretching. <laughs> Are you stretching? <laughs> They're so unbelievably cute. I feel cute's aggression when I see these guys. But yes, Davi and I are going to keep trying that other, other burrow system because it really is quite something to see. The squirrels wake up and then the bandied mongoose wake up. Yolandi, absolutely. Yes. By far. They're very um, chunky monkeys ground squirrels huge bushy tail and really chunky bodies by far they're bigger than tree squirrels tree squirrels are actually very small it's the tail that makes them look much bigger they do also have a bushy tail but it's not oh another one hello It's the tail and the treats because it actually makes them look big, but they're not. They're tiny. And I haven't yet met a ground squirrel that's not relaxed. Milo, I have no idea. I really don't know, I'm afraid. I've seen burrows that are incredibly deep that humans can walk into them. And I've seen burrows that are really shallow. So I really, I couldn't even guess, judging on what we're looking at, how deep it is. I think it'll be quite deep. I think it'll be a really elaborate system in there. There are quite a few holes. But I couldn't say for sure, Milo. Guinea fowls are not happy, but I'm not sure why. Probably us. Parry, yes. Little heads popping up remind you of the whack-a-mole game. I remember that game. It's quite brutal, actually, when you think about it. <laughs> I'm sure there were going to be little more heads popping up. I bet you they're still sleeping. Honestly, on the really cold mornings, the mongoose and the ground squirrels wake up really late. <laughs> they will not leave their burrow until the sun is out and it's at least warmed up. Yes, we know this. Look at their big bulbous body, they're so chubby, it's cute. And when we stopped at that other burrow I was telling you about the other day with the bandied mongoose, we just got there as the bandied mongoose were leaving and there must have been about 25 of them. It was unbelievable. It's a huge burrow system and both species obviously utilize it. It's amazing. <laughs> that was a big stretch. Kathy Lee, you're saying good morning to the sweet, fluffy fellas. And Davi missed that cute stretch there. They're all stretching. It's very cute, Kathy Lee. Unbelievably fluffy. And like I said, really, we saw them in... They're really common. 
Swalu and Central Kalahari Game Reserve, and they're, they're really relaxed. We can drive right past them. They won't run away. They've got other worries, and it's not the vehicle. Not everyone gets excited to hear a leopard chuff, spot a pangolin, or see a real impala rut. But if you are wild about the wild, you can become part of a community of like-minded nature lovers and share authentic wildlife experiences with the world. Join the Explorers Club and you will also enjoy the many benefits that come with it too. Wild with Explorers, it's in your nature. Yeah, and I think uh, Tlalamba one and uh, Odie and Cedric zero. That's all I can say for now. <laughs> because uh, I really thought it was we were very close so finding that uh, female leopard, and uh, I even went into the block there now. Nothing, nothing, nothing. It's so it's so thick. Unfortunately, still it's still so thick. The grass is high and there's so much vegetation around due to all the rain we've had in, of course, our summer and even our beginning of our winter. So um, it's really made things a little bit tricky at the moment, but it's fine. It's all right. We might, we might still get, we might still find it. But if it is at Lalamba, I'm sure it is because you're from Gary Dam. Tumbeta house, she came all the way into this drainage line across from the open clearing, heading like south. So knowing her, sometimes she'll pop out on Philemon's cut line and head towards Treehouse Dam. So I think I might just go and uh, bloom a little bit there at uh, Treehouse Dam and um, just take a look. Maybe we find something else outside as well. But uh, ah, so close, but still so far, as they say. Yeah. Might also just go make a turn around at the hyena den again, just to see if anybody's popped back that side at the hyena den. I was there a little bit earlier, but uh, nobody was there, I think. Uh, but I'd had tracks going back and forth, so we'll see.
Karabo. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure my, like Molawati must be maybe from the Kruger side. Uh, I'm not too sure exactly Molawati's origins, uh, origin in that. I don't, I'm not too sure on that, but you know, sometimes, oh, nice bachelor of impalas here. Sometimes if you've got uh, leopards coming through from Kruger, they become a little bit uh, uh, skittish because they're not. They haven't really been introduced like our Sabi Sands leopards, um, you know, two vehicles showing it's an unaggressive object. So, and they might have had a bad encounter somewhere. So, yeah, you know, it might be because he's from Kruger's side. A nice bachelor herd of impalas, but look at them. All such great, great condition. But yeah, well, we're going to continue towards Charles Dam shortly. Let's head over to Andrew as he's got old Pumba. Ah, good luck on your side, Cedric. Ah, oh, it's just running off now. We have a massive male warthog here. This is only my very second warthog that I've seen while I've been here. At Pridelands and how long have I been here now today is the 8th so it's about nine days yeah time flies when you're having fun this eight days nine days has just flown by so quickly Wow I've got a little bit more time I'll be here until the 14th of the morning then Chris will take over and then I will go up to the Northwest Medique for a short stint but yeah the water has just moved off Panda let's have a look at these impalas again while we do have them here it's been a fairly quiet morning here actually. We reckon there is a, a leopard in the block actually not too far from where our camp is um, at Eco Training. So we will definitely work the area this afternoon, but there's still some plenty time left. We might just get lucky and, uh, and find it. Looked like a male leopard by the tracks. Just a beautiful morning overall. Wow, so hello Stacy. Yes, oh, there's parts of Pridelands I'm still yet to see Stacy. Um, so we explore mostly the western parts of uh, of Pridelands because of of signal. That's that's where the best signal is, and uh, we try and hang around those areas because we don't really want to leave our directors, you know, dry like hanging. Uh, just now maybe they need us and uh, we're in a poor signal zone and that's no good so we, we stick to the west so we're getting to know the, we the west very very well but now the eastern part is also a very rich area of game and wildlife and sometimes um, there are things that are seen out there but our signal is not the best there but nevertheless if there is something out there um, we actually will go out there and actually test the signal and see if it's good and uh, we got the ostrich in that poor signal zone the other day dipping itself in the water dunking itself and that worked out well so sometimes you know it uh, you get rewards when you take risks but you must take calculated risks that's the that's the catch on that one Yeah, we saw a batelier fly over this morning it was very quick and uh, also african hawk eagle and I learned something new from Cedric the other day that actually his favorite bird is the African hawk eagle. And it's always good to know, you know, get to know our naturalists the way we do. Oh, squirrel, not too happy in the tree somewhere nearby and a lilac breasted roller as well. Harold, very good question and I'm glad you asked that because some people they are under the idea that warthog and bush pig is exactly the same animal just a different name not true they're two different species of animals now warthog a nice big heavy male warthog we're gonna say is around 80 kilograms heavier than me and panda and so a bush pig some of them have been known to get up to an over a hundred kilometers a hundred kilograms now bush pig is a unique one. It's, a, it's a, an animal that comes out at night time mainly. That's the, the main time it comes out. And uh, they are very omnivorous actually bush pig. They'll eat absolutely anything and everything. And uh, warthogs, more day active. You know they, they're grey, warthog, with big tusks. They come out more in the daytime. 
but also they can move around at night sometimes. Myself and another guide at, uh, at Amakala, who's no longer there in, anymore, he's in one of the neighboring game reserves um, and used to be the head guide at Woodbury. We saw a warthog walking around in full moon at about nine o'clock at night. Now that's a bit of a risk, as, as you know. When predators are hunting, it's a very quick action sometimes and there's no option to get away. So it was taking a risk. Now bush pig, they've got much smaller tusks, brown in color, bigger, a little bit more scarier looking. And then they have this white ridge down their back. back. That's a bush pig. In my entire career, um, 17 years now, going on 18 years in the bush, I have seen a grand total of maybe about 20 or 30 bush pigs. Whereas Warthogs, yo, I would love to know the number, probably thousands and thousands and thousands. So it just goes to show, you know, bush pigs are a lot more elusive than that of warthogs, but they are more active at night. And uh, that's when, you know, most of us are less active. Um, we go back at a certain time, so we don't spend too much time out in the night, sadly. And uh, we miss some of those cool animals like bush pigs, and I think that's one of the reasons. But look at these impalas, just enjoying the morning over here. Lots of nice things for these impalas to eat. I can hear a lilac breasted roller somewhere squawking around here. Just brilliant. Now, we just want to play you another video quickly, uh, just so you can understand what eco training is all about. We're going to play you the 55 day course that you can do. Have you ever aspired to become a skilled safari guide, traversing the African bush and encountering wild animals up close? Whether you're a retiree, a recent graduate, or a professional seeking a change, the 55-day eco-training program is for you. This comprehensive course will provide you with an unparalleled opportunity to gain expertise in every aspect of the African bush. With the coaching of experienced training guides, you'll embark on an unforgettable adventure that will give you a deep understanding of wildlife, conservation, and African cultures. Over the course of the program, you'll learn essential skills such as animal tracking, bird identification, and bush survival techniques. But the benefits of this rigorous training go far beyond technical knowledge. You'll also form close bonds with fellow nature enthusiasts and conservationists from around the world, creating a global network of like-minded individuals. Your days will be filled with excitement and wonder as you observe animals in their natural habitats and explore the diverse landscapes of Africa. From the first light of dawn to the vibrant hues of sunset, you'll be fully immersed in the sights and sounds of the wild ways that most tourists of this continent forego. This once-in-a-lifetime opportunity cannot be replicated. Why not take the leap and join EcoTraining's 55-day program? If you sign up locally or internationally using this promo code, you'll receive 2,000 Rand off. Return home with newfound knowledge, a qualification, unforgettable memories and a sense of accomplishment that will last a lifetime. Hello everybody, we have managed to fix the steering rod that I bent. I'd love to say I had a lot to do with it, but I just stood there and handed spanners around and that was about it. And Opar the magician managed to fix it. So you've just learnt about the Eco Training 55 day course. I must say, if I was a young buck, which I'm not anymore, I'd definitely head off on the Eco Training 55 day course even if I was a slightly older buck with no bush experience, I'd still do it. Ah, we're getting uh, Cedric calling us now. Go ahead. Cedric is calling us on the radio. He uh, sounds so depressed, he, he may not actually cope with the rest of the day. He says there's Juju here. Copy. <laughs> he's, 
He sounds very miserable. All right, he's been around here looking for these leopard tracks. We're going to do the same because we haven't been doing it all morning and see what we can find. Lauren's managed to find some equids to show you. We've come across a typical Medikwe scene. Long grass, shepherd's tree and zebras. We're actually in the area where we saw the Ard wolf last time. Not that I expect to ever have a sighting like that again. I think that was once in a million, but still, the more you drive these roads, I guess, the more chance you're going to get at being lucky of having those sightings. But right now it's been dominated by zebra and I'm not complaining. One lucky zebra didn't make it through the night last night, but otherwise the populations here are just really, really strong. It's so beautiful. And the sun is just now delivering warmth. We're at that perfect time of day where it's starting to get warm. Yeah, and it means it's a perfect time for a scratch. Mm. Gotta get that scratch. <laughs> oh, it looks like it feels really good. Ollie, <laughs> I really don't know if I can answer that with any sort of scientific rigor there. I, I don't know if they kick or bite more. I've seen them bite and I've seen them kick. I'm not sure I could say which one they do more, I'm afraid. Zebra's fighting is one of the, the worst things. Oh, I've actually seen a lot of bad things now, but... It was one of the most disturbing things I saw during my training. I was with Brain, and we were in Torchwood at this time, when we were traversing Torchwood. And we just watched two stallions fight. They were kicking each other, and one stallion just managed to get under the other one's tummy and bite and completely disembowel the other one. And they were still fighting, even although the other one's innards were hanging out. It was just really horrible to see because obviously zebras are not renowned for being the most aggressive, murderous animals out here. And yet that one was never going to survive. And it wasn't taken by a lion. It was one of its own. So the fights can be terrible. But as for wh whether they bite or kick more, I'm really not sure. I think they use what they can when they can in that given situation. But to be kicked by a zebra, oof. Oh, we're going in for the bum scratch now. He really likes this. <laughs> and I've said this before, but obviously we see predators kill other animals regularly. And I guess that's just the natural cycle of things. But when you see a species really harm another of its own kind, I find that a little bit difficult to watch. I understand it. I know why it happens. And I know that it does happen. But I find that a little bit tough. I think it's safe to say he really enjoyed that scratch. I don't think he's going to be the last zebra today that uses that sort of dead tree as a scratching post.
We are just going to drive a little bit closer. The zebras have moved quite far behind the shepherd's tree now. This is a little bit better, I think. I don't think there's ever really been a drive where we've not... Oh, <laughs> we're back at the scratching. This time we're doing it ourselves. <laughs> I don't think there's been a drive where we've ever not seen zebra. It's a wonderful reserve to see them. In such high numbers, and again, they are really relaxed. I have been on reserves where, for whatever reason, the animals just bolt from the car and it makes it really difficult to have nice sightings. Everything is really long distance and sort of visuals that are a little bit tricky. Whereas in Medique, They've obviously done things very, very well here. I could only really hear my own voice there, Davi. Did you get that comment from Sally? Such perfect mane. Ah, perfect mane. Yes, Sally, all zebras do really. If it starts to flop over, it means they're unwell. But when they're in good condition, it stands up so perfectly. No hairspray or nothing. But yes, Medique have done things really, really well here. To have all the animals so relaxed. Okay, leopards are not, but I mean, that's just norm for a leopard, really. But otherwise, the animals are really, really habituated to the vehicles. So we are admiring a view down at Amakala Game Reserve. Still looking for the cheetahs and on the positive side they have been found, all three of them together. So we are going to be making our way there as soon as we can. But in the meantime we figured we'd show you a really strange little cloud. <laughs> it looks like there is a very deep valley somewhere in the distance. And it's really cold in the valleys at night and what's happening now is as it's heating up there's a lot of moisture that's rising and forming clouds and that cloud is going to probably go all the way up. Either it's going to completely dissipate or it's going to go and join the other clouds high up in the sky. But it just looks really really strange having one cloud rising from that valley because there isn't a cloud in any other valley. So that must be a very deep and very cold valley far in the distance. <laughs> it looks quite out of place actually. <laughs> Everything else looks so calm. Willie, thank you so much for your question. I think you know if you're gonna if you're gonna come and visit Amakala there are obviously a lot of different lodge options but it depends what exactly you are looking for. Um, there's I mean everything you can think of from from very secluded and quiet to you know much more community feel so lots of people all together that kind of thing so it really depends what you want if it's me personally I would say a good overall mix with really really good game viewing in particular whether you're at the lodge or on safari and nice location, nice and central, so you can get to everywhere pretty quickly, I would say Woodbury Lodge. But um, I think it really depends on what you are looking for. I think, you know, looking, looking out over the basin, that's kind of where we go to, if we want to see lions, if we want to see elephants, if we want to see giraffes, zebras, hartebeest, black wildebeest. Everything seems to congregate there, so I would definitely say that that's a good spot to be overlooking. So on a personal side, I mean, I've stayed at Woodbury before, so 
<laughs> I feel like I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> Definitely a spot that I would go back to over and over again. But it depends what you are looking for. But either way, if you're going to be coming to Amakala, please come say hi. <laughs> Leopard lover, that's a really cute question. I think, to be honest with you, it depends where you are and who you're working with. <laughs> Ego is laughing and nodding. Uh, but yes, sometimes it absolutely feels like you're just hanging out with a best friend, having the best time. Um, and I honestly think Amakala is one of my favorite locations to do that. I think of, of all of the places I've been with Wild Earth, I think Amakala is actually my favorite. But yes, Igor has been a treat the last while. I'm very sad that we're saying goodbye in a few days. <laughs> but Igor and I have been such good friends for so long that I feel like anywhere that we go would be good. It doesn't have to be Amakala. But yes, absolutely, the people we work with become like family, which is really special. Sorry, I'm just listening to the radio because we're waiting to go to the cheetahs. But yes, you know, we, we do have those kinds of relationships where, you know, I think it's different for every single person, but we definitely do become best friends and almost family with a lot of the people that we work with. So it is a pretty cool way to do your job. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't even feel like work. Okay. We are going to hopefully make our way towards the cheetahs sometime soon and we shall send you over to James to see what he is up to in Juma. I'm just looking at Kharat and wondering if um, anyone would ever confuse us as family and I... <laughs> I don't think that would ever happen. <laughs> Uh, right, we've <laughs> we've come to this area. This is the drainage line in which we think that Tlalamba or whoever this beastly leopard wandering around here is has disappeared, and we haven't found any other signs. So we stopped and we're having a listen, and I thought I'd look at two things while we're here, and I'm going to try not to sneeze, or I should look at the, maybe I should sneeze. <laughs> it's an old trick. If you look at the sun, you'll sneeze. <laughs> okay, right. What I wanted to show you was this bit of elephant dung. Not because I've never shown you elephant dung before, but because I spoke at great length, I think it was the day before yesterday, about finding the right vintage of elephant dung. And this particular elephant dung is now past its sell-by date. And you can see the termites have got into it and they have eaten off a lot of it and in fact they were living in it for some time and now they've moved off. And I say it's past its sell by date because it no longer has that really delightful smell. You can you get hints of it, sort of earthy pleasant smell, but it's really starting to lose that pleasantness and it's just starting to smell like dry grass. Then that's not all I have for you. I have two leaves. And I wonder if anybody would like to guess what they are. Which two leaves are these? Tricky. You, you've got about 10 seconds. 10 seconds before I tell you what it is and address Katie's a uh, comment who says, yes, probably a good idea. Ignore the kitties, and if we're lucky, they'll just pitch up. Yeah, that is true. This tree is the sandpaper bush, Erita amina. And it's really very sandpapery. It's good for cleaning teeth. It's really useless as a sandpaper though, because, well, it'll just rip apart. Okay, Arita amina. Normally grows on termite mounds, has quite pretty, pretty uh, flowers. Well, 
I don't believe we've had one big five sighting today, but that is about to change with the great Lozapop at Madikwe. Oh, we did have a big Dagaboy down by the water's edge. running now. Don't run. Yeah. What did you do to your horn? He's broken his left horn. It's actually not that common to see buffalo with snapped horns now that I'm thinking about it. Impala, yes, very common. Buffalo, not so much. The impact to have caused that, oof, I don't want to think about that. Well, I don't think this morning has been our morning, but at least we got to show him to you. We are at a jam called Collabing. And let's see if anyone else is drinking. Of course, it's not that hot, but water is not readily available anymore. Envy thing's going to start congregating here. Big aggregations of all sorts of species. As you go further and further into winter, it'll be colder, but the sightings around the water holes are going to increase by a tenfold. I'm actually sad I'm not going to be here for it. No one else is drinking, but we shall give you a view of Golabang Dam in all its glory. Here you go, Javi, you can work your magic.
well the, war uh, the morning is starting to warm up and nicely and of course you can see this young elephant bull has decided to come down to one of our dams to twin dams to have a nice early morning drink what an old male very, pretty much in uh, either like the early 20s maybe mid 20s so about 25 plus minus around there it's not fully fully grown yet but all by himself but sometimes you'll find these younger boys will tend to join other ones the older males but it doesn't look like Once, they dominated the earth. Now, they are frequently despised, persecuted, and hounded. Reptiles and amphibians play a hugely important role in our planet's ecology. They represent an evolutionary memory. A reminder of our own fragility. That the Anthropocene is surely a blink of evolutionary time. They may no longer dominate, but reptiles and amphibians remain a crucial and fascinating cog in the Earth's biological systems. Apologies everyone, it seems we may have lost Cedric. I'm sure we'll get him back as soon as we possibly can. I think the universe was overexcited that we found the three cheetahs together again. Yay! Now they are on a mission, they are busy moving at the moment, so we're actually not going to stay with them for long, which I know sounds a bit weird. But if they are on a mission and they're finally together again, we're going to leave them to it. But we wanted to at least show you that all three are back together. They are looking amazingly healthy. I think it was just a temporary split from something that may have frightened them. But at least they're all back together again. They are on a mission. There are some other vehicles that are going to want to say hello as well. Show their guests some very pretty cheetah boys. And this just makes me happy. Julie, they are very in sync. It's like these three all think with one mind sometimes. And I can totally see why. I mean, they're a very tight-knit coalition. They want to do everything together. That's why yesterday was such a shock to see one on his own and the others, who knows where they were. Maybe they were here. None of us actually checked here. back in their favorite spots, doing their favorite routes. So they're headed straight towards the cheetah tree that we had the hardy dars in just now. So perhaps they're on a scent marking mission. Now that they're back together, they're of the mindset that it, now is the time to reinforce that bond and reinforce the scent markings in the territory all together, all three of them. You can see they're very interested in smells. Tails are up in the air. So they're definitely picking up on something in the grass there. And they are on a bit of a scent marking mission. Right, while we've got some pretty tails in there, I can try and move us a little bit forward. See if we can get one more view and then we'll leave them to it because they're such pretty boys and we're just happy they're together again. They're moving their best spot to rest. Right, let's see if we can get another view. I'm hoping that we do, but they might actually go and have a lie down already. Go over to Andrew in the meantime to see what he's up to at Pridelands.
Now we've just found a beautiful silhouette of a lilac breasted roller. I did mention to you earlier on we could hear one squawking away. I believe it was this one because you're not too far from that area. Very pretty little birds. I believe that this is unofficially known as the national bird of Kenya, unofficially, which is quite interesting. Lilac breasted roller. In my time that I've gotten to know lilac breasted rollers and I've watched them, uh, I've managed to see them catch very large scorpions. You can't believe it. They catch these big full-grown burrowing scorpions, which is very, very long, by the way, and very thick, and they hit them on the branch, ba ba ba, and then they, they try and stun it so they can actually eat it. And the time that it takes them to eat a full-grown scorpion is no time at all. Uh, it's just basically in, and they swallow it. Very cool birds. Now, sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, you can hear them. They're making this quack, 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 quack sort of sound that's in the air, catching the attention of a female. And then they do a combination of these sort of kites and rolls and swoops down towards the ground. And uh, a female within the area hopefully will enjoy that and uh, will accept him as a mate. Now, they do this in the breeding time a lot. And the roll is very beautiful. Pizza, good off, good morning. Um, yeah, well, here in in South Africa, most definitely, you know, the purple roller to the European roller to the lilac breasted roller, they are all pretty. Now, this specific one, um, they've got, you know, I know. I'm not sure if you're seeing too much of the color there, but they have a combination of these turquoise purples and blue colors, and even their tail feathers are, are colored. Um, and if you ever get a chance to find one of their feathers, which I've only managed to do a couple of times, the feather has also got a combination of colors to it. Very interesting little birds. They'll go for anything. These are strong little birds. And uh, when they will see something on the ground, they'll just swoop down, choop, pick it up. Sometimes they can even be things like crickets, mainly crickets and insects and so on. But scorpions, as I've mentioned, a uh, few of the, the species of beetles, perhaps. Now, if you can see the beak or the silhouette of the beak over there or the bull, it's a very heavy duty bull with a, a little bit of a sharp turn to it. And that is a very efficient bull because they're able to really finish off what they're what they're catching, finish it off and eat it and kill it. That's very important. Wonderful birds. You see the impalas are everywhere today, Panda. Oh, there's some more over here. We've probably seen, I would say, over a hundred impala in the, in the areas that we've driven. Maybe about 150. Felt Orca, morning and a good question. Good to hear from you again. Yeah, European rollers are, are very much uh, migrant birds and they are migrating all the way to Europe. Isn't that a far way to go? Can you imagine, you know, it's a long haul for a bird just to migrate and get to the same areas every single year. I find that very fascinating. And if you ever get a chance to watch swifts and swallows that are migrants, that they return to the exact same nesting site every single year without fail it's amazing now if i think about it i'm not sure where you all are from some of you are from america some of you are from germany some of you are from italy perhaps or wherever the case may be when i look around me i don't know the direction where's italy from here where's germany from here panda do you know have no idea, you see. And these birds, they know. I've got to go in a straight line, shurp, using prevailing, prevailing winds and so on. And astronomy, they use stars to, to navigate their way. And they go in a straight line because that is the easiest route possible. Interesting. Wow. Panda, what is your favorite bird? You love the African fish eagle? Ah, uh, I agree with you there, especially with that call, very much so. Jarrett, in the mission control, what is your favorite bird, if you can tell me? <laughs> mm. 
lovely morning. I can hear some guinea fowls and a white crown shrike in the far distance calling. Nice one, Jarrett. Jarrett says he loves the African grey parrots, which are fantastic. My mom used to have one, and I remember one by the name of Arthur when I was growing up. Very cool. And if any of you have got some favorite birds, maybe even some of those favorite birds can be found here in Pridelands, and then we can try and look for them at some point. But let us know, definitely. Panda, let's take a look at the impalas a bit before they, before they disappear. Now, what you're going to notice about these impalas over here, that they're all males. This is what we call a bachelor herd of rams. So now we've just gone past the rutting season for impala. Uh, so a lot of the males would have herded females and sort of, you know, gone through with the process of rutting and hopefully inseminating some of the females. But then you're going to get some that were not strong enough. They didn't, maybe they, you know, they've, they've, they've just reached maturity. They don't have tactics, they, they need to learn and they need to train and this is exactly what this group is. These are a bachelor group of impalas which are going to take this time to play wrestle and spar to gain knowledge about fighting and condition as well and then hopefully next year, March, April roughly, then um, they would have been fully prepared for the rutting season and they can find a harem and they can mate as well. But for the season that's just passed, most of these males never got that opportunity. Now what's interesting as well is sometimes bachelor herds can be more vulnerable than that of breeding herds, sometimes. Why is that? So now when impalas are sparring, their heads are, you know, they, they, they focus on each other, they're not really watching around and their heads are down and they're wrestling and sparring that this does put them in a vulnerable state and the clashing of the horns that sound that can be heard by leopards and lions and they know that there are potentially some preoccupied impalas or animals busy fighting it might be an opportunity to strike now for a leopard to carry this very animal up a tree they make it look so easy they're incredible you must try and carry an impala up a tree. There's no way. No way. Not some of these vertical trees that leopards climb. Beautiful head. Well, I just don't think that I can top the entertainment value of my last segment with the elephant dung and the sandpaper bush. So this time we're just going to be driving. I know that there are far too many of you who will have had nigh on heart attacks from the excitement I managed to conjure with the elephant dung and the sandpaper bush. And so what we've done is we've done a big walk down in the little riverbed where hopefully Tlalumba was or the leopardess was, found nothing. And now we're just sort of doing a general drive around the area to see if she doesn't maybe pop out, deign to join us. Yes, Terence, I have been on a game drive with guests and not find a, found a single thing. The worst one, I ever did, and I remember this distinctly, was a drive at Ngala Private Game Reserve, not too far from here, about 50 kilometers north. And I mean, I had a spectacular tracker to work with, so it wasn't the fact that we were just unskilled, although I may have been, he certainly wasn't. And we drove around that reserve from six o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock or half past 10 in the morning 
and we covered a total of about 65 kilometers which is a very long game drive and we saw one Stienbock on Buffalo Flats which was probably about half an hour after we started the drive and three Impala so it was dire I mean it really was it was it was bad it was bad I don't think the guests said anything I think they were just stupefied by the time we got back it was beastly hot and they were stupefied by my driving the heat the kind of lack of action I'm not sure they were bored or not but they were definitely stupefied anyway that was one of the quietest drives I ever took in fact the quietest sometimes that's just how it goes what's it and then this drive, yes, thank you, Gerrit. And then, and then this drive. This is the... Until that, until... And, until today, that was the quietest drive I've ever taken with guests. Hmm. It's just how it goes. What have we seen today? Have we put a mammal on camera? I think I'm the only mammal we've put on camera. What was that, Jarrett? Jarrett, the director, said something to me, but I can't, I didn't hear it. I just heard Moujin. Ah, question from Julia. Ju Julia wants to know if I've ever been chased by an animal. Um, I was chased yesterday briefly by a monkey that had got into the kitchen and it had filled its cheek pouches with lemons small lemons and it was then now looking to escape and i opened the door and it chased me out the door because well i mean i actually just ran away because i saw it but i've been chased by elephants yes uh, mostly in camps trying to chase trying to chase the elephant out of the camp the elephants quite frequently will turn on back can be quite dangerous so you need to be careful of that uh, I'm chased by a buffalo on a bushwalk not, I mean, not to the extent that I thought I was going to die, but I have been chased. There are some tracks there, aren't there? Female. Big, big male. Big male leopard tracks along here. Probably ye olde ghost. Mulwati. It's very helpful when the cameraman is able to track as well. I've never been chased on foot by lions or leopards or hippopotamus. Hippopotamus is what you don't want to be chased by, I think. You don't want to be chased by any of these things, but hippopotamus especially. We can have a brief look at the batelier chick, which is back in its nest. You see it there, Gerrit? I mean, look, we are seriously clutching its straws at this stage, but it is in there. You can just see its head silhouetted against the fantastically gorgeous <laughs> lighting. There you can see it. Look at that. Hello. Where are your mummy and your daddy? Thanks, James. Yes, uh, being chased by animals, definitely. <laughs> There's been some interesting ones in my, in my life. Um, 
because uh, one of the ones I remember, <laughs> remembered quite a bit is when I was younger and I was staying of course up in Guiani and uh, we used to go to the Klein Nataba River and like with my brother and some of the friends and that and there used to be always some cows and bulls around that area <laughs> and we got chased the once and uh, I had to jump into the Klein Nataba and in the Klein Nataba there is of course uh, crocodiles and uh, I'm sure a hippo or two that side, but I mean, I was so small, clean forgot about it. But uh, yeah, no, that was uh, that was quite an interesting time in, in my time in my life around the northern areas of South Africa, as well as my neighbours uh, or my neighbour. Uh, she had geese, and I remember, the geese were I don't know, they just didn't like me at all. They, my older brother and myself used to walk around there like at our neighbor's yard and going to visit their kids and all that and you know like our friends and that um they used to leave everybody else but they always used to chase me for some reason i don't know they just did not like me at all so uh, i didn't get like i didn't grow like a fear to of course the geese i mean it's just like you know i didn't kind of um become scared of them but it was just one of those things like why me what did i do wrong to them so yeah Oh, we got some uh, beautiful uh, water thickness, of course. And can I see here that now and again a high pitched noise of theirs, a nice beautiful call. And psh, 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 psh. And there's quite a few of them, so I'm not sure if they might be nesting around there. Oh, Elaine, yes, numerous times, numerous times. Um, sure. Uh, I don't even know how many times. So like uh, lions, quite a few times. I mean, uh, and kuhumas, majingalans, mapojos, sticks. Yes, uh, like a lot of lions. Uh, you know, like when you used to track them down and all that. Never really had a bad moment. Uh, like they had one or two bad moments with lions. Most of the time they would see, see me and just like, you know, warn me or they'll just get up and move away from where we are or where we were and all that. That's of course with my track and myself. Um, but of course my worst, uh, my worst uh, situation with lions, I think I've mentioned this story many a time with uh, the coalition called the Majinga Lions, so four male lions. And of course that was uh, the most hair-raising moment in my life, in my career. Still to date, I can like, I actually have, sometimes I have nightmares. I actually like kind of uh, wake myself up by, you know, dreaming about those four male lions. But beautiful boys, beautiful. But of course we're tracking myself on foot and tracking them down. And, you know, we went into the vegetation. It was about maybe 150, 200 meters in. And uh, we had their tracks, and then next moment, I, it's like my track and myself, like, yeah, we can smell like, you know, like fresh blood, you know, like it's got that metallic smell to it. And um, we kind of zigzag, zigzag to that, you know, to that smell to see. We looked at the wind and all that. And out of this uh, round leafed teak thicket, we just had two of the males out of the four, two of them came charging like full tilt, coming straight towards us. And they stopped about maybe two, three meters in front of us. And then when the one stopped, it actually kicked up a whole lot of sand and dust and stones. It's like kind of hit my legs. And so, and I just kind of, I thought they were going to go for me. So I kind of pulled away and I grabbed my tracker. My tracker grabbed me. We were like <laughs> almost like two kids, like about to cry that we didn't get our sweets. And uh, we just like, my tracker just started shouting and then told me, just don't run. And I'm like, no, whatever you do, just I'm not going to run, just don't run. And uh, they did that for like, those lines came like three, four times at us. And then eventually, of course, uh, we got out of that area, out of that situation and uh, got back to the vehicle. This Father's Day, let's honor our wild dads. Fathers serve as an example by protecting and providing for their young. Join us as we raise a toast to all the extraordinary wild dads who inspire us to be brave, adventurous, and independent. Join in our Wild Dads Father's Day special from the 17th to the 18th of June with your dad. Thank you. 
I mean, I, I really can't add anything further to the, uh, to the scene. We're drifting home for breakfast now. Uh, the most positive part of this morning is the fact that today is breakfast burger day, uh, which everyone loves. Everyone loves breakfast, breakfast burgers, normally homemade buns, homemade patties, uh, probably the odd chip, uh, one or two slices of cheese, some caramelized onions, lettuce, uh, no, at least a liter of coffee, and maybe even an egg. That is a stump, yes, it's a stump and not a leopard. That's very true, Centipede. Even on a quiet morning in the bush, the bush was still beautiful. Because it is, and that's inescapable. We can't have action every day, and it's just infinitely more pleasant than driving to an office or well, that's it, basically. I mean, this is what we do for a living. And what a wonderful place to be having a quiet day at the office. Nothing to complain about. Nothing whatsoever. Gerrit and I had time to reminisce about when we were children. And uh, the fact, the TV that we used to get and in South Africa, we only got television in 1976. And when we and I were kids, we remember that on Fridays, you knew the week was over because Gummy Bears was on. <laughs> That's how quiet the drive's been. Anyway, we'll try again this afternoon. Who knows what the bush will give us afternoon. In the meantime, it's time for some breakfast burgers, coffee, and no doubt a thorough shouting at from my seven-month-old child. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions and comments. You do really keep us going on these somewhat dry days. We will see you this afternoon at 1430 Central African time. Until then, stay safe and happy. Bye-bye.